Standing up in McKinney, this is According to Callus, episode 559, coming to you on January the 4th, the year of our Lord, 2024. That's right, we've made it to 2024, and it's still early. Today, we're going to change pace. We're going to do something uh, a little more laid back, something a little enjoyable. We're going to get back to kind of doing the mini reviews of books. So I had the opportunity when I was down at the Texit Con to meet the author, Richard Fossey. Now, he wrote a book. It was called The Dixie Apocalypse. Now, I know some of you uh, potential listeners out there probably got your... Uh, your fear on now, right? Oh, Dixie, you can't talk about that. Well, you know, that's okay. The book purposely does not start at the beginning. It, it starts at the, let's call it end of a long, bad series of events. So I'm going to read you the prologue. They're going to hop to the back page or the back cover and give you a little bit of the background of what's going on here. And the reason why I'm doing this is I want to whet your appetite. Now I'm going to be honest. There are lots of interesting passages. There's lots of, you know, fun tidbits and Clearly, the man is familiar with the geography and some of the local customs and whatever else. And that lends itself a lot of credibility. But it's also a bit of an everyman saga, right? The guy that gets caught up in a s- series of events and just gets involved and can't see his way out of it. He feels like he needs to be involved. Like... This is history unfolding before him and he can be involved in it. And he gets more and more pulled towards the center of events and things happen that he would have never, ever guessed. Now, the book ends, and I want to say this first and foremost, the book ends with a non-distinct ending, which is to say there's a whole lot more that could be written that takes place during the events or after the events or, or how do you want to say it? parallel to the events? Well, I guess it's during, but with a different set of people. So there's, there's like a little world that's been created here and it's, it's interesting and it's kind of fun and it's not at all dissimilar, if you will, to the world created, uh, by some of those Rawls books. Now, different s- scenario, different, uh, circumstances for certain, but I like the idea of having parallel stories is a possibility. And I, and I don't know what the author's plan is, but it is definitely fiction. It's definitely dystopian, but it's hopeful. So it's called the Dixie apocalypse. All right. And I encourage you if, uh, if you like this genre, go out and give it a read. I, I found it quite enjoyable and, and I read it, uh, over two weekends and I, Probably if I would have set the time aside, I would have finished it out in a single weekend. It's only about 240 pages long. But again, as I said, very enjoyable. So the prologue, how many years has it been since I received a social security check? How long has my city been under martial law? When did my neighbors start carrying handguns? When was the last time I saw a policeman, drove a car, or drank a cup of coffee? And from there, it jumps into the main character and his time on his farm off of River Road outside of Baton Rouge. Again, it's captivating. It's enjoying an enjoyable read, if you will. All right. Now, let me read you the back cover because this kind of lays it together. First, the petroleum ran out. Then the plagues came. Climate change was running rampant. Hurricanes hit. Wars broke out. Economies or the economy collapsed. Electricity stopped. And thus the new times began. Willoughby Burns is a lawyer, professor, and husband. Well, that's what he was in the old times. His college education and law degree mean nothing when constantly battling thieves and starvation. Now he's a widowed farmer in Baton Rouge, supplies food to the military, the last 
bastion of order in a broken country. While sent, or when sent on a supply run to Houston, Texas, Willoughby's job as a civilian commissary officer plants him in the thick of the Texas independence movement. Sieges on army forts, attacks from rebels, vying for the lush Louisiana lands, threatens his farm spread like weeds and will uproot his life he's cultivated. All he wants is peace, but in the new times, humanity reaps what it sows. Pretty good, huh? Written by Richard Fossey, this new future apocalypse book takes our entire world and tilts it on his side. Familiar and daunting all at once. The Dixie Apocalypse critiques and captures the American South when all that is left is a whole lot of spirit and stockpiled ammunition. <laughs> all right. Uh, for those of you wondering, this was put out by Brown Books Group. Uh, you can find it at brownbooks.com. RichardFossey.com is the author's page. Okay. So now I'm debating whether I want to read you a bunch of excerpts out of this or just kind of tell you the general theme. And uh, being that I'm not far into this episode and I kind of want to keep it a little short because I've uh, gone long or it seems like I've gone long in the last two days, certainly been amped up on (laughs) previous episodes. Uh, I'm giving you a break, both rhetorically and pace and thematically. Okay. So the book starts with the notion that this guy was fairly successful in the old world, his old life. He had made a, a a place in it. He had been, he had been doing his part, doing his part in the previous society, right? The, the old society that no longer exists as an attorney. And then a college professor, you know, a man of books, a man of learning. And he's cast into a society that no longer has any, ready value for book learning. Can you grow a field? Can can you raise livestock? Can, can you fix a car? Can you keep this bike moving? Do you know how to test a battery or recharge it? Do you know how to function the solar panel or get a water wheel rolling, right? Can you handle that firearm? Can, can you handle anything beyond your books? Now, this is a curious thing, and it's it's a common uh, theme in apocalyptic novels or writing, and to a lesser extent, dystopian in and of itself, right? This is something that has already occurred. Now, look, I know there's some of you that turned up your nose on the idea of climate change. Set that aside. Don't, don't, it's, it's just a thing. Climate changes. Uh, I don't believe man has any real relevant long-term effects on the world climate. Can we dump enough oil to potentially damage an area? Yes. Can we burn enough wood in an area or cut enough wood down in an area to potentially damage it? Yes. But long-term, the earth will heal itself. It's amazingly resilient. That being said, climate changes weather patterns change. And most of that's dictated by the sun. So don't get lost in that detail. Get lost on the idea that things happened. When you lose easy access to cheap petroleum, the world changes. And a lot of other things grow out of that. The world is heavily dependent on the idea that we have cheap petroleum. The world has benefited immensely by cheap petroleum, but if it should ever end, the world will change. And when the world change, that ripple effect continues and goes on. This is a common theme and a common subject. Throw in multiple other things and then throw in the political angle here, right? So this guy gets caught up in a situation That is a distinct possibility for our future. Now, the specific details, that's not really relevant. The the hows and the what fors, does it really matter? We're dealing with a situation where the power doesn't come on anymore, whether it's been the grid that's been damaged or the grid that was never upkept. I mean, just think about the America we have today. 
Think about the lack of effort that is put in to maintaining the infrastructure. Oh, don't worry. We've got plenty of money to give to people that came here illegally. Don't worry. We've got plenty of money to protect a border overseas. Oh, don't worry. We've got plenty of money to take care of retired boomers. But we can't invest that money in protecting our future. Some of this is about priorities. Some of this is about realism. Some of this is just the way the world is. You can get mad. You can become bitter, but it doesn't do you any good. You have to accept the world that you live in. You have to accept that even if you want the best possibility, the Panglossy and best of all worlds is where we live. None of that really matters. It's what is and what it could be. Where could we go? What's next? The author wrestles with the idea through his character of, I don't have a purpose that I originally chose. I have a new purpose. That new purpose brought me closer to family, brought me close to a community, and I, and I do my part to keep things going, but the reality is I'm not doing what I was theoretically born to do, what I was raised to do. Being, being thrown into a series of events that embroils him into the events of his neighboring state and puts him in the essentially passenger's front seat while they're going on. He becomes a navigator to the birth of a new nation, a new state, a revitalized Texas. Now, while the events that occurred in order to bring us to this place in this novel are not ideal, certainly not anything that I would want to experience, nor would I want for my children to experience, that is a possibility, a distinct, distant possibility, but a possibility nonetheless. And it doesn't matter what the cause is. The uncertainty behind it leads credibility or lends credibility, if you prefer, to the possibility that this is what happened. Could it be one event or a series of events or cascading events? It doesn't matter. It happened. And now that it happened, what do we do next? Where do we go? How do we feel? How do we filter this out? How do we deal with this? These are all good questions and they lend to the underlying story. You have to understand this guy gets caught up in a situation that's beyond him, gets dragged into something that he's entirely uncomfortable with. But sooner, I don't want to say this, (laughs) sooner or later, he finds that his prior life, his prior education, his experiences come in handy as he gets drafted into service of the newly forming independent nation of Texas. The Republic of Texas reborn, if you will. Now, I want to take a little brief pause here. I don't think the author nor anybody really would prefer for this the way that things happen, right? We don't want to see the destruction of the United States, the destruction of the world economy, just so we can get an independent Texas. But it lends itself to a plausible way that Texas it can go about doing its thing, at least nominally peacefully. Right now, setting aside the doom and gloom on both sides of any equation, nobody wants the United States to utterly collapse in their heart of hearts. Sure, they would like the federal government to go away, right? Poof, in a big cloud, maybe. But we don't want all the stability and everything that comes with that to go away. We, we would love for the runaway spending. We'd love for the immature and the irresponsible behavior that comes out of DC to go away, but to go hand in hand, the security that the world's largest military has would go away. The security that the nuclear stockpile provides would go away. But the uncertainty of the massive amount of debt, the uncertainty of the, responsibilities that can't ever be met financially would also go away as a, as an aside you know when when great britain separated from the eu nobody wanted the eu to be successful more than great britain 
if for no other reason so that they could leave peacefully and still continue to trade with the EU. They just didn't want to be under their thumb. In many ways, I believe that's what Texians believe. We want to go our own way so we can do our own thing, but we're going to be a good friend, a good partner to these United States. And what the irony is, is that people out there say it's going to bring about war because they'll never let us leave. They can't let us leave. And what about this? And what about that? They, that's because they don't want to find options. They don't want to find solutions. They don't want to find a way to make things work. In the story, some of this drama does come up. The remaining fractions or pieces of the federal government don't like the fact that Texas is choosing to go its own way. They, they, make an attempt to interfere with it. And that does play out interestingly in the book. And and at this point, I will say this is a reoccurring theme with any book that deals with an independence movement or a secession movement or a revival of a former nation, right? The pre-existing nation or the predecessor takes offense, doesn't like, wants to prevent. So that's, kind of rehashed an old idea, but it fits in nicely with the narrative. It, and it's not overly reliant on that. It's something that just takes a place within the story. Within the story, they lay out the sales pitch, if you will, to the people of Texas. What is it that you can get? What, what's of, you know, what is in it for you? In many ways, I would like to see a similar practice play out. And and I know the folks over at T&M are doing this in their own way. All right. I am not critiquing what they're doing or I'm not saying they're not doing it. I'm just I'm thinking about this as I'm reading about it in the story, how they went about doing how easy it appears in this post-apocalyptic world that they're pulling this off. And it's really not apocalyptic, but it's, you know, it's a dystopian drama that's playing out and we're here offering you hope. It was almost reminiscent of some of the scenes in the postman in the book, not the movie, or just the mere act of somebody showing up and bringing back a piece of normalcy gives people hope. It gives them something to grasp for, something to look forward to, a return to something better. In many ways, the idea of a resurgence or a returning Texas is just that. Now, one of the things that I found interesting is on the cover of the book, it has the Texas flag above an inverted American flag. Now, it does cover that in the story, and it does explain what's going on there, and I will tell you, and I know I've maybe mentioned this a time or two in the past, that is the universal dispra- or <laughs> the universal sign of distress, right? If your flag's inverted, it's a time of distress. Now, in the story, it goes into greater detail on what's all going on here, but clearly it's appropriate because of the times of distress that are going on. And what's interesting to me is the people that get most adamant and most vocal in their opposition or their anger at some of the symbolism don't understand it. And I, and I don't think it's that they're stupid. I just believe they're uninformed or they're ill-informed. They don't understand that these things exist for a reason. There were purposes for them that predate any of us. It's in the flag code in case you're wondering, but Now we have to deal with the last aspect that's at play here, right? So there is a functioning government that's in failure. They're not able to do the very basic functions that they were created to do. And they oppose and are upset by the fact that somebody wanted to fill that gap. In many ways, that's what we see now, but at a much grander scale. Our government feels the need to fulfill every need, every desire, every want of everybody so that it can maintain control and present a illusion of order, an illusion of protection and provision that really don't exist. And it's only when you use the 
direction, if you will, of a collapsed government, of a dystopian future, that you can reemerge with ideas of independence. You can reemerge with a revived culture of independence, a revived culture of mutual respect and working together in community. Most of that's been gone. Now, I've listened to some things and I've read some things over the last couple of months that kind of have led me to reevaluate some of the things that I held as an assumption, as a understanding for so long. And, and when I talk about my culture of independence, I want to be very careful to distinguish that from individual independence. The two, to a degree, go hand in hand, but they're not exactly the same. There can be no revived Texas. There can be no recovery without community. But you have to be careful how you define community as well, because if you stretch that community out any further, you end up with a monstrosity on the Potomac. People don't know any better. People are used to being dependent. They're conditioned to think they're not capable of taking care of themselves or their families any longer. What What's painted in this book, in the Dixie Apocalypse, is that a notion that people are resilient. They take the bad things and they roll with it. They make the best of it. They repurpose things. Indeed, the conversation of how they reutilized a college campus was pretty impressive. I, I know most of the time when you read about it, they always talk about how they reuse a dorm or they reuse the stadium, mostly so that they can put the people in that they want to control there. But this was used in a different way. Now, I, I don't know right now what direction I want to take with some of these thoughts that I've been percolating through some of the reading and some of the reevaluating of different things. But I got to tell you, we got to give thought. We got we to gotta put some effort into some prepositioned ideas in the event that they become necessary. I don't want to dwell on things. I don't want to, I don't want to wish worse things. I, I'm not looking forward to a bad outcome, but it, to a degree, you need to play the what if it's part of being prepared for life. It's part of being prepared to take care of yourself, your family, your community, because I will assure you of one thing that those that are in control, they seek to maintain control, to maintain order at all costs. And that cost is going to come out of you and I. Again, an issue that is lightly touched on in this book. What happens when you can no longer control people, when they won't be controlled, when they want to do their own thing, when they want to reorder their community? These are things that are touched on. They're things you have to be able to wrap your head around and consider potential outcomes. Consider what does that look like? Now, no, I don't want to, I don't want to d dwell into something that's outside of my sphere of expertise or general knowledge. I don't want to trample into somebody else's genre here, if you will. But I, but I think it plays a part or a piece on if we're going to talk about the future, if we're going to talk about getting from here to a culture of independence, if we're going to talk about from where we're at to being able to legitimately say Texas goes first or Texas is first or Texas first. There are a lot of things that need to be considered, a lot of things that need to be consulted with prior to achieving that. And I don't know what that's going to look like for each individual. I don't know what that's going to look like for each community. But I do know is these are things that we need to look into. We need to spend a little time in. But also we need to understand what are some of these words or ideas that are being thrown around that we're seeing and being told and being propagandized into believing. I know last year I spent some time talking about Christian nationalism. The big boogeyman, if you will. I still don't think it is. I do have 
some questions about some of that. We'll take some time talking about that later this year. I I recall that there were some uh, concerns on what happens if we go this Texit route, right? What what what's the next step? Again, those are fair questions. Now, Daniel Muller's covered that in his book, right? Go check it out, Texit, right? But there are other things that are only briefly touched in, and again. This is directly related to the concept of Texas first, directly related to building a culture of independence. Those two go hand in hand. There can be no Texas first without a culture of independence. And it's no point in having a culture culture of independence if you're not going to utilize it to build Texas first. Now, when I reviewed the five principles towards the end of last year, I did that for a reason. I wanted to revisit where we've come from. I wanted to revisit a direction that we tried, an opportunity that we took. We can see right now what the outcome was. Now, some of it was maybe we didn't do it right. Some of it was we trusted the wrong people. And some of it was just, it wasn't the right way. It wasn't the right idea. I can't say for absolute certainty what the best answer is for you. I can't say for absolute certainty what's going to work 100% of the time. But what I can say is we need to reevaluate. We need to reconsider. What could we do differently? What can we do better? Reading books like this, they give you the opportunity to let your mind free, to reconsider things, to look at things differently, to take away some of those preconceived notions to ask the question, what if I will tell you first and foremost, that is one of the reasons why I enjoy these types of books. It's not because I focus on the negatives or the problems or the bad things. I look at the possibilities. I look at the positive outcomes that could occur after you see your way through the bad things. Bad things are always going to happen. It's part of life. It's part of just functioning as a human being. It's part of creation. But it's how we deal with those things. It's how we navigate those things. And it's how we come through at the other side that brings about the things that are worth saving, the things that are worth cherishing. So before I go too far off, before I deviate from my topic, my little review of this book here, I want to remind you all of these things are possible. All these things that I think about come out of the fruit of the book. And it's not just this book. There's plenty of other books like it. Now, this was an enjoyable read. It was well worth my time. I highly encourage you to go pick up the book. I I think I... uh, I might have paid twenty dollars for it. I was glad to do it. I'm certain it's cheaper on uh, uh, everybody's favorite Amazon here, um, and I will post the link if I can find it. But I encourage you to read these books. I, I encourage you to enlighten your mind. I encourage you to look at things that you hadn't otherwise considered. If for no other reason, the idea of repurposing things, the idea of reconsidering the value of certain things in light of different circumstances. I think they're fair questions. I think they're fun questions. And honestly, it's a first step to cultivating a culture of independence. So I know I kind of deviated from the review of the book, but again, the book spurred the ideas. The book encourages thinking outside of the box. And with that, this has been according to Kels. We're going to wrap it up just a tad early and I will see you on the other side.